Thank you very much. Good morning. It's a pleasure for me to start the 2011 Ground One Talks. And uh, thank you, everyone, for coming today, especially in this weather. The place I came from, actually, last week was about 25 degrees Celsius. I think it's nice, but during the summer, it was just more than 40 degrees Celsius. So I still consider where the weather is better. So I have another two years to consider about it. And uh, thank you especially for uh, Dr. McCann. I, I can see him now from the geology department. I, I think he joined us, and we can share his experience about the talk today. So the talk today is about the uterine fibroids and avoiding dysfunction. I think it's quite an interesting topic, especially for me. I uh, was not familiar with this in my uh, during the time of my residency and. Uh, as a urologist, I saw maybe once or twice, and during these few months, there was a few cases, and maybe some of you are familiar with some of them, so it would be nice to share your thoughts about it too. So the objectives for this talk today are to define the etiology and the histopathology of the symptoms of the uterine fibroids, to review the literature concerning urologic complication resulted of these lesions, to describe the optional treatments briefly of those lesions. So maybe we'll start from the nomenclature. So there are quite a lot of names synonymous to this benign tumor. The most common one are the uterine fibroids and the leiomyoma, and all are, are connected to the tumor that originate from the small mass, uh, smooth muscle layer and the accompanying uh, connective tissue of the uterus and other tissues around it. It's quite often that uh, these uh, lesions are uh, multiple, and the name there is uh, diffuse uterine leomyomatosis. And there is a very rare entity of uh, leiomyosarcoma, sarcoma, and I'll speak about it a bit later. So maybe I'll start with one of uh, the last of the previous uh, case, uh, 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 report, case presentations. It's a 50-year-old uh, female G2P1. In 2008, she had a bilateral radical mastectomy for breast cancer without any uh, adjuvant treatment. There are not other uh, medical concerns, no allergy, and no history of urinary tract infections. The last few months, she felt a pelvic fullness with urinary frequency and urgency she hadn't experienced in the past. In her physical examination, she's quite a slim lady, uh, the abdomen there was a palpable, non-tender pelvic mass, and the bladder was displaced anteriorly in the bimanual examination. Her blood test, the lights, the renal function, as well as the CBC and the urine chemistry were all quite normal. The lady had an abdominal ultrasound, and the first thing that we can see here it's a quite very enlarged uterus that was found. We can see this heterogenic consistency of this uterus. There are a lot of uh, small lesions varying in size from two to six centimeters. All the lesions are round or ovary, as we see here, well circumscribed hypoechoic lesions. We can see here one of the bigger one. It's almost six centimeters in size and its diameter. And there are plenty of them in all sizes of the uterus. Here are smaller ones and so on. The other thing that we see that the right adnexa, as well as the left one, without evidence of mass or fluid collection. This is the right kidney. The pancreas looks quite normal without any space-occupied lesions, but we see this moderate hydronephrosis in the right side, as well as a moderate hydronephrosis on the left side. And maybe we can see even a proximal moderate hydroureter. The bladder looks intact without space-occupied lesions, and maybe in the Doppler we can see a jet sign from the offices, uh, the post void was quite small, 58 uh, cc's. 
So in summary, in this US uh, ultrasound findings, we can see the bilateral model that hydronephrosis with proximal hydroureter with markedly enlarged uterus and multiple large fibroids without adnexal masses or fluid collection that could be seen. She had a cystoscopy. The ureter was quite intact. There was no intraluminal mucosal lesions, and the, uh, there was a normal trigon and a normal ureteral orifices. It was an impression of extensive compression of the bladder that had been seen. In the uh, uh, pelvic MR she had, we can see all, uh, this uterus with all these lesions around it. They are quite a big one in the right side, as we see here. It's quite another impressive images. And we see it in the transverse uh, images, and then in the sagittal one. And in the sagittal, we see how big it is. And it compresses the abdominal wall till almost the umbilicus. And they are quite impressive uh, images. The coronal uh, images show us the uterus, and as well we can see here the both kidneys, and luckily we see that there is a quite a spontaneous resolution of the hydronephrosis in both sides of the kidneys. We can't see the ureter, but the hydronephrosis was quite resolved. So the, in summary, the MR pelvis is the uterus with multiple subserosal fibroids and resolution of the previously demonstrated hydronephrosis. This resolution might be due to a uh, spontaneous uh, download of uh, fluids uh, that was during the ultrasound. So if you are talking about these fibroids, it's important to remember that it's the most common benign tumors in females. About 20 to 40% of women will be diagnosed with fibroids, but only a fraction of them will require any treatment due to their symptoms. The fibroids are quite dependent on uh, their uh, hormonal uh, environment, especially the estrogen and the progesterone, to grow, and therefore they're more relevant during the uh, years, the reproductive years of the female. About uh, the risk factors, they're about twice as common in African-American women compared to uh, white women. They're more, more common in overweight women maybe due to the increased estrogen secretion from adipose uh, tissues. Another known risk factors include a first degree relative, which they had uh, about two and a half fold risk to have uh, fibroids during their span lives, and six fold time risk to early onset cases. Another risk factors are null parity. Women suffered for polycystic ovary syndromes, diabetes, and hypertension. Microscopically, we can see that those fibroids are uh, round or oval, well circumscribed, solid, and bright. The size may vary from microscopic to huge, considerable sizes. They typically, uh, as big as they are, it's more, more easier for the women to palpate those uh, uh, lesions through the abdominal wall. Microscopically speaking, the lesion cells resemble normal cells, and as we know from other benign tumor organs, they are formed uh, with different directions, but, but still those cells are uh, uniform in size and shape uh, with scarce mitosis. There are all kinds of variants of this uh, tissue but still, all of them are benign. Inside the connective tissue, there might be another cells, including the adipose cells, and this subtype is called the lipoleomyoma. That's how it looks like, microscopically, from inside and outside, 
quite an enucleated uh, lesion, as we see here. As I said, there is a quite a rare uh, issue about uh, the malignancy. Less than uh, one out of 1,000 lesions are uh, malignant. Uh, it's not very common practice to biopsy them, uh, typically because of quite low sensitivity. And uh, maybe one of the signs that we can remember of those lesions, it's a fast-growing uh, tumor, especially after the menopause, when the hormonal environment become reduced. There is no consensus, actually, whether uh, this is a transformation of the benign tumor, but uh, last articles suggest it's a de novo disease and not a transformation. The fibroids are uh, monoclonal tumors, and approximately half of them show karyotypically detectable chromosomal abnormalities. When they are multiple, they are present, uh, will usually have mostly unrelated genetic defects. But the exact etiology is not uh, clearly understood, and there's a lot of hypotheses, but the, I think the most recent one is the combine, and the combination included ge the genetic predisposition as well as the hormonal exposure, especially in the prenatal uh, periods, and the effect of intrinsic and intrinsic uh, hormones that might be due, especially in the industrial era. As we mentioned before, the fibroids growth is strongly dependent to estrogen and progesterone, but still it's not a straightforward. And uh, for example, during the pregnancy, uh, we see that although there is quite um, a lot of hormones, morning, uh, it's still uh, there is some kind of protective effect and they don't grow during this time. So the protective effect might be might to a couple of reasons. Some of them, there are in some interactions with other materials, including the oxytocin receptors. It's quite interesting. And especially the estrogen and progesterone by itself, indeed it is shown there is some immunolog and other immunological players that interact with them, influencing the hyperplasia of these lesions. Changing the balance by down-regulating apoptosis and increasing expression of anti-apoptotic factors might uh, increase these lesions. So the estrogen are quite a promotive of those lesions. And what is even more interesting is the progesterone and all the family of the progesterone uh, that have like a uh, balance and a uh, double pattern and ways. On the one hand, the progesterone is thought to promote the growth of fibroids through the upregulating of some growth factors, as shown here, including the TGF, beta-1, and beta-3, and the survival through upregulating BCL2 expression and the downregulating of the tumor necrosis factor alpha. But on the other hand, the progesterone is believed to counteract growth by downregulating IGF-1 and this phenomena of two ways, as we see later, uh, can be uh, used for uh, new drugs. The overexpression for some enzymes that help and make a conversion of androgen to an, uh, estrogen possible. One of them is the aromatase, and there are another one, and, and this is quite another option for new drugs, as we'll see later. And this induction and overexpression of estrogen receptors might help to the environment of hormonal prosperity. So, briefly about the diagnosis, the ultrasound is the standard tool to evaluate the uterus for fibroids. The MRI is the optimal imaging modality for diagnosis, characterizing and localizing the fibroids due to its inherent soft tissue contact resolution and a multiplanar capacity. There are other tools, such as hysteroscopy and histocelvingography, but their use is quite limited, especially for the submucosal type that we talk about later. So the location of the fibroids is very important and main factor, 
especially uh, due to its related symptoms that this fibroid might have. And secondly, about the optional treatments that we might, con might consider. First location is the intramural fibroids, which located within the wall of the uterus, and they are actually the most common type. Unless large, they may be asymptomatic. They all begin in, as a small nodules in the muscular wall, and these intramural uh, fibroids may expand inwards and causing distortion and even in elongation of the uterine cavity. The, uh, the second location is the subserosal fibroids, which located underneath the peritoneal surface of the uterus, and they can grow out in a papillary manner to become a pendunculated fibroids. These pedunculated growths can actually detach from the uterus and become what we call a parasitic fibroid. The submucosal fibroid located in the muscle beneath the endometrium of the uterus, they might distort the uterine cavity, and even small lesions may lead to bleeding and infertility. They might be a pedunculated lesions too, and the term as intracavitary fibroids. The cervical fibroids located in the wall of the cervix. It's, uh, yeah, I have to uh, mention that there is quite rarely but can be found uh, those fibroids in the supporting structures and the ligaments attached to the uterus. And they might have a secondary change inside that may develop in the fibroids, including hemorrhage, necrosis, calcification, and cystic changes. This is quite a demonstrable feature that we can see the submucosal location, the intramural location, and the subserosal one. There is another entity that we might remember, and this is the metastasis. There are a number of rare conditions in which fibroids can metastase. We know that they even can metastate in the urogenital organs, and we can find them from time to time, even in the urethra, in the bladder, and in the ureters. But they are still can grow in benign fashion in all of these types. And they might be dangerous, especially when they're depending in other organs and in other locations, including the fibroid with a vascular invasion which an ordinary appearing fibroid invades into the vessels, most of the time there is no risk of recurrence. The intravenous leomyomatosis, which might go inside the veins and going through the vena cava expanding to the cardiac, and in the cardiac involvement it might be fatal, secondary to cardiac arrhythmias and valve impairment. The benign metastasis fibroids, which can grow in more distant sites, such as the lungs and the lymph nodes, and the source is uh, not entirely clear, still it might be fatal, especially the pulmonary type. And as we know, the disseminated interperitoneal homeomatosis, which can grow diffusely on the peritoneal and mental surfaces, and can stimulate a malignant tumor, but still behaves benignly. So what are the symptoms of the uterine fibroids? The most important and the most common one, actually, are the gynecological and the obstetric, which included an abnormal gynecological hemorrhage and heavy or painful periods. This menorrhagia might even be, become to an anemia with iron deficiency. Another symptoms are the pain during intercourse, the infertility, and all the complications during the pregnancy uh, that caused to miscarriage, bleeding, premature labor, or interference with the position of the uterus. The less common one, including the backache, the gastrointestinal symptoms, which are an abdominal discomfort and bloating, and the constipation, even a painful defecation. <coughs> and the mo another most common is the urinary, and in other reviews we can find there might be an irritative symptoms such as urgency and frequency, as well as an obstructive symptoms with uh, retention due to a compression of the ureters or uh, the neck uh, of the bladder that may lead to shadenophersis, either unilateral or bilateral. So what are the literature 
what can we learn from the literature concerning this uterine fibroids and related to the uh, urinary retention? So surprisingly, after searching the database, there are numerous of case reports, and uh, unfortunately, with those uh, case reports, it is not possible to estimate the frequency of uh, the urinary retention due to uterine fibroids. Uh, all those uh, case reports are uh, a bit uh, different in the location and the type of treatments. Uh, that case, most of the treatments might, uh, may resolve and help to these tumors in all the case reports that I saw. Uh, another trial, which uh, is a prospective one, is the trial that published on, uh, first published on Radiology 2008, and the name is the EMI trial, which is a, th a comparable treatment with embolization compared to hysterectomy, and the results from this uh, randomized clinical embolization versus hysterectomy. In this trial, which is well-controlled trial with good randomization and intense follow-up, and may I say with Western European compliance issuing, with a variety of symptoms and the influence on quality of life. So it's quite a busy slide, but what we can see that this randomization to two groups of uh, uh, embolization and uh, surgical procedure, and one of the things they had is the questionnaire that they had pre-procedurally and then post-procedurally six weeks after the procedure, six months, 12, 18, and 24 months. And the type of the uh, questionnaire they uh, used was the UDI, the Urogenital Distress Inventory 19. It's uh, quite another busy slide. I just compressed here all the questions they asked, and we see that the, the question included discomfort, pain, urinary incontinence questions and overactive bladder pressure uh, questions. And uh, uh, all those questions included the obstructive as well the irritative and the symptoms types questions. So the results of this UDI was as seen here and they are quite interesting. What we see is the score is uh, ranging from zero to 100 in which the higher the score is indicates worse functioning. And we see preoperatively or pre-procedurally uh, the score, and then post-procedurally during the follow-up. And we can see some very interesting things here. The first one is the improvement in the urinary functioning occurring mainly during the first six weeks to six months after the treatment in the both groups. After six months, the UDI score scored for stabilized in both groups. There is a not significant difference between the two op the treatment options, either the embolization or the hysterectomy, but still it might be seen that the embolization had a bit better response of the symptoms. This uh, article had an update on uh, like a few months ago in the American Journal of Obstetric and Oncology. And this, in this update, they checked the follow-up after five years. And what we see is still there is improvement compared to the pre-procedural symptoms, but there is still, and the, still it's a trend of exacerbation comparing the the early post-operative operative, uh, uh, period. Still, the embolization might be a bit better, but not significantly compared to the hysterectomy in this uh, review. So this, in summary, the, there is a significant improvement in urinary symptoms, about 50% that occurred with uh, both modalities, mainly during the first six months after the treatment. There is a non-significant difference between these two groups, and the improvement, but, dot, but no disappearance of the symptoms might seen during the post-procedural uh, period. Another uh, trial 
uh, that I want to speak about, and not only because it's a Canadian one, is the Ontario Uterine Fiber Embolization Trial. Uh, this is a prospective multicenter clinical trial involved follow-up of women undergoing disembolization for symptomatic fibroids. And one of the questions of uh, the patients, uh, they were asked pre-procedurally whether they had an urinary urgency or frequency. Uh, the question was on a seven-point verbal scale regarding their previous urinary symptoms. Those 306 uh, women, which was 60 per, almost 60% of uh, the style that had uh, either urgency or frequency, they had another three months after the procedure, they had uh, telephone follow-up interviews in which 98% uh, of them completed this uh, uh, telephone review. And what is seen in this scale, seven point scale, this is our results. Well, the patient, 86% uh, of the patient said that there was an improvement in their urgency or uh, in the frequency. 70% the symptoms are resolved and 36% much improved, 15% moderately improved, and 17% slightly improved. 30% of the women reported that there was no change, and only two women said that it was a slight or moderate exacerbation and worsening of these symptoms. It looks like very nice and uh, quite straightforward, but still in this uh, trial, what they found that the fibroid-related symptoms were independent of the uterine volume as well as the post-embolization fibroid volume reduction. And, that's, and this one is, uh, you can add another, at least three reviews that showed no connection between the post-procedural and the symptoms after that, especially the urinary the symptoms. Even more, uh, we can add to this data that some of the questions they raised in these reviews where the volume reduction did not correlate with the improvement in the fibroid-related symptoms. The odds of the improved bulk-related symptoms were not associated with, with fibroid volume changes in another uh, review. And in the, this review that was improvement in another symptom, the menorrhagia, it was unrelated to the post-embolization volume reduction. So how can we explain this? And is there a possible reason for urinary symptoms of uterine fibroids? We know that even the bladder outlet obstruction might be combined and due to an, either anatomical or functional reasons. And there are actually other than mass effects explanation to uterine fibroids induced urinary symptoms. As we know, especially in women, the urinary tension uh, might be not only due to an obstruction, but to poor the tools of contractility, causing by an orogenic, myogenic, psychogenic or pharmacologic or combined issues. And so it's quite interesting, and we have to think, is there an optional theory is explaining urinary improvement after uterine fibroids procedures? So what might they have been? One is that is, of course, the mass effect reduction. The releasing of the urinary tract or the obstruction might improve the uh, anatomically vascularity and neurogenic functioning. And one of the uh, vascular uh, improvement is uh, the theory that's called uh, vascular steel theory. And in this theory, the hypervascular fibroids steal or shunt blood from the surrounding pelvic, creating a state of relative chronic hypoxia and the relative chronic ischemia of the pelvic organs produce organ, organ dysfunction and related symptoms. And by this theory, if we can reverse uh, this situation, and uh, the relative ischemia of the pelvic organ uh, will reverse and may account for some improvement in fibroid-related symptoms, especially the acutely before significant shrinkage of the fibroid. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, that's right. And that's what the main idea that this may be uh, some kind of combination of the obstructive or another irritative symptoms that can add and can manage. And that's why one of the questions, is there only an obstruction or there are another issues that might combine? And as we've seen, that's why one of the reasons that all the, uh, that there was an improvement in the trials that, I saw, uh, that we see, but there was not a, a reduction and it didn't go to zero. It goes only about 50% of improvement, but not a complete improvement. And that's an important issue. Another uh, theory that especially the radiologists uh, uh, think about is the, the change in the fibroid consistency. So in the post-embolization MRI, it can demonstrate that the infarcted lesion, which is might be softer and uh, therefore less likely to be obstructive than the hard and the fibrous one, the pre-procedurally. And finally, there is the multifactorial theory that speaks about that fibroid symptomology, like so many other diseases, is quite multifactorial, and different weighted contribution of factors lead to a unique symptoms profile in, in uh, each unique uh, female. So after all these uh, theories, what are uh, the treatments? So I'll speak a bit about all the optional treatments. And uh, the treatment might be a medication to control symptoms, medication to shrinking the tumor, myomectomy, hysterectomy, various non-surgically or surgically added methods to reduce the blood supply of the fibroids, and minimal or less invasive technologies. About the medication to control the symptoms, as we know, the, N the NSAIDs might reduce the painful menses, the oral contraceptive might reduce the uterine bleeding and cramps, and the iron supplements is good for this iron deficiency anemias. There is a more elegant um, kind of treatment, and it's the Revnorno just uh, intrauterine devices, which is a synthetic progesterone used as an active ingredient, and it decreases total and free androgens as well as estrogens, and by that it might possible reduce the, uh, and limit the menstrual blood flow. By using uh, intrauterinely, we might uh, reduce the uh, side effects, including nausea, vomiting, stomach pain, dizziness, breast tenderness, tiredness, weakness, headache, and so on. Uh, the hormone release is in the target, and it is reported as good results specifically for women with fibroids, including a substantial regression of fibroids but there are not randomized control trials to improve this uh, about the fibroids. Another uh, option is the danazole, which is a synthetic steroid, uh, which is an, an androgen and a multi-enzyme inhibitor of the steroidogenesis. And by that, uh, we can just use it in uh, those who suffer from the menses. There is a short treatment with danazole resulted in reduction in the mean nutrient volume up to 30 to 37% in different uh, kind of reports. But uh, the main obstacle are the, uh, the significant side effects uh, that about 5% suffer from increased weight gain, edema, and especially the muscularization and the acne. The danazole still can be used as an adjuvant therapy after the completion of the GnRH therapy, and maybe a reducing of uh, the dosing might reduce the side effects. As I spoke a bit before, the uh, next generation drugs that I might mention, including the aromatase inhibitors that have been used experimentally to reduce fibroids, and the progesterone antagonists that have been shown in small studies to decrease the size of uterine fibroids. Now, another uh, type, which is uh, azoprisnil, which is a selective progesterone septal modulator, and it's currently tested with uh, very promising results, but still it's only as an next generation option. The, the GnRH hormone analogs, which as a urologist we are quite familiar with, can cause a temporary regression of fibroids by decreasing the estrogen levels, and they are quite efficient in reducing fibroid size. 
They are used not more than uh, six months, and it's even preferred shorter, uh, due to the side effects, as we know, as uh, osteoporosis and other postmenopausal complications. We have to remember that in many cases, the fibroid will regrow after the cessation of this treatment. Uh, however, there might be some kind of benefits a much longer time in some cases. So indications for GnRH agonists, and this is like from the textbook, includes the preservation of fertility in women with large fibroids before attempting conception, treatment of anemia to allow recovery of hemoglobin level before any surgical management, treatment of women approaching menopause, pre-operative treatment for all those large fibroids, treatment of women with medical cones to surgery, and treatment of women with personal or medical indication for delaying any surgery. The indication for surgical therapies, we have to remember that asymptomatic fibroids do not usually require surgeries. The indications, even though are abnormal uterine bleeding with resultant anemia and unresponsible uh, unresponsive, sorry, to hormonal management, chronic pain or acute pain, especially in torsion of pedunculated or prolapsed submucosal fibroids, urinary symptoms or signs such as hydronephrosis after a complete evaluation, infertility, especially with fibroids as the only abdominal finding, and markedly enlarged uterine size with compression symptoms and discomfort. So the surgery there some options for surgical treatment. The hysterectomy, which is the classical method of treatment fibroids, although it's now recommended only as a last option, it is still the leading cause of hysterectomies in uh, North America. The myomectomy, recommended especially in the cases of women who have not completed her bearing child or who express an explicit desire to retain the uterus. And for those who cannot prevent the recurrence of, and we have to remember that we cannot prevent the recurrence of fibroids as, at a later date. The surgery of myomectomy included the stereoscopic one. The fibroid is removed by the use of a zectoscope that we are quite familiar. And uh, this is an outpatient procedure with either local or general anesthesia, most often recommended for submucosal fibroids, and most often. Uh, it's recommended for fibroids that are not greater than five centimeters. This is an example of submucosal fibroid in, in hysteroscopy, and we see the exectoscope. The laparoscopic myomectomy, as we know, all the advantages of the laparoscopic uh, issues, that including a small incisions, short hospital stay, less postoperative pain, rapid recovery, and good assessment, etc. And et and the studies have suggested that laparoscopic myomectomy leads to lower morbidity rates and faster recoveries. They are not generally used on a very large fibroids. They are actually uh, excellent for the pedunculated uh, subserosal fibroid, as we can see here. But still, we can use them for the intramural lesions, as seen in this procedure. The laparotomic myomectomy, which is the most invasive surgical procedure, uh, is included an extensive laparotomic procedure and may necessitate that in, a, in the future the birth might be conducted by a cesarean section. The recovery time from this laparotomic procedure are much more elongated compared to the laparoscopic, as we know. The, another elegant way to deal with this uh, fibroids, and this one is the uterine artery embolization, and maybe Dr. McCann then can add his points. This is a uh, femoral artery catheterization is needed, an interarterial uh, infusion of embolization particles, as we know in other organs, producing ischemia of the fibroid uterus and subsequently decreasing the volume of the fibroids. Patient will usually recover from this procedure within a few days, its major uh, side effect is severe pain after the procedure, and uh, the impact on the fertility and miscarriage is still controversial. There are some studies, some of them, or a couple of them, are already shown. Another one is the hopeful study, 
which was a multi-center retrospective cohort study comparing the embolization hysterectomy and included one, more than 1,000 women. There were fewer uh, complications uh, by women in the embolization uh, cohort compared to the hysterectomy with fewer uh, serious adverse effects than hysterectomy and similar rates of satisfaction. You can see here the particles that are uh, supposed to be doing quite to the right uterine branches of, uh, of the uterine artery. There are another option, uh, which is the uterine artery ligation that can be done laparoscopically. It's a, it's a, a minimal invasive method to limit blood supply, and uh, we can do it either laparoscopically or transvaginally. The principal mechanism is quite uh, similar to the embolization. There is a similar efficacy, uh, but it's easier to perform and fewer side effects uh, are expected. Uh, but still, the embolization is currently appear much more effective in direct uh, comparison of those both, uh, both procedures. Another elegant options are those image guided thermal therapy, and this is the last issue. And as we know, there is the laser ablation that we can use the infrared laser energy that is converted to heat and causes the uh, eventually coagulative necrosis. It is first described in 1989 as a procedure performed via the laparoscopic or endoscopic route. It successfully decreases fibroid volume to 50 to 70 percent of its uh, uh, volume in symptomatic women. And it first reported about 10 years ago uh, percutaneously treatment for uterine fibroids. And this treatment is better be monitored by uh, MR thermometry. Another option is the cryotherapy or the cryoablation, which is a thermal ablation method that causes cell death by rapid freezing and then following rapid thawing, as we know from uh, the kidney and the prostate uh, procedures. The temperature must be lower than uh, minus 20 at least uh, at Celsius, uh, degrees Celsius to completely destroy the tissue. The cryoablation for the uterine fibroids was initially introduced using either laparoscopic or hysteroscopic access. Uh, this uh, uh, cryoablation in 2001, Cyril first reported its use for uterine fibroids with MR guidelines, uh, with enabling monitoring the, develop, the uh, developing size of the ice ball and its relation to the tumor. There are still post-procedure complications, including fever and abscesses that we might remember. The prophylactic antibiotics then is quite recommended. And the follow-up study shows viable results with uh, 30 to 80% of volume reduction of these fibroids. The radiofrequency ablation is uh, ablating a solid tumor with radiofrequency energy resulted from heating that is produced when ions follow an oscillation of a high frequency alternate, alternating electric fields. And this heat causes, again, coagulation necrosis of local tissue. It was first described in 2005. And a large area of necrosis, up to six centimeters, can be achieved by a single axis. And therefore, maybe it's compared to the cryo, it is relatively time efficient. Still, the main problem is that it's not accurate temperature monitoring, and the real ablation area could not be seen during this treatment. The last option is the uh, quite interesting one and promising one is the magnetic resonance guidelines focused ultrasound. It is a non-invasive intervention that uses high intensity focused ultrasound waves to ablate tissues. The MRI guides and monitors during the treatment. Uh, it, the first FDA was in 2004 for fibroids treatment. During the procedure, uh, the liver focus ultrasound energy is guided and controlled using MR thermal imaging. The MRI provides a three-dimensional view of the target tissue, allowing the precise focusing of ultrasound energy within the desired volume we are wishing. The MRI also provides quantitative real-time thermal images of the treated area and allows to the physician to ensure the temperature generated during each cycle of this ultrasound energy but still it's quite uh, sufficient to cause thermal ablation within the desired tissue 
and if not, to adapt the parameters. That's how it looks like. We can see the, tran the transducer, the water bath that it's including, and the focus ultrasound beam that is focusing three-dimensionally to the tumor. We see this three-dimensional treatment planning, and the benefits is fast recovery uh, with uh, no hospitalization, low rate of complication, no general anesthesia, and non-invasive uterine sparing procedure. You can see here in the MRI this pre-procedural lesion, and then 24 months later, the shrinkage of the tumor. So finally, in our, uh, the case uh, I presented, based on the options suggested, the patient decided to have uterine uh, artery embolization, and uh, she's scheduled actually to next month. And in summary of this uh, talk, apart from urinary symptoms, other indications usually drive the patient to seek treatment based on case and clinical studies. Fibroid may contribute to some degrees as cause or exacerbation to urinary symptoms as seen. Treatment of fibroids, either surgical or minimally invasive, may have a, as high as 50% improvement in urinary symptoms based on ARCTs, and more controlled studies are needed to appreciate the incidence and the optimal strategy for urinary related symptoms of uterine fibroids. Thank you very much, and if someone has questions. <laughs>